afternoon. I would like to start my speech by thanking the organizers of this session for accepting my contribution, and especially Tobias Krapp for inviting me to visit the site of Amarintos this summer, and to Samuel Verdan for uh, his tour at the Temple of Apollo at Eretria this July. Today, my presentation will focus on the connectivity of the Temple of Apollo at Eretria during the early Iron Age by giving you an overview of the site, its main finds, and reinterpreting them. So, as you know, uh, the sanctuary uh, of Apollo Daphne Foros at Eretria is located in the center of the island of Lubia, facing the southern coast. And it was, in fact, located around 200 meters away from the seashore, which made it very accessible not only for those who lived in the island, but also for the seafarers that would reach the Ubian coast from the sea. Um, the Temple of Apollo Daphne Foros was the main urban sanctuary of Aretia, and the use of the site starts well before the Archaic and Classical periods. Uh, the three early Iron Age periods uh, that um, Polixenia already mentioned are established by the proto-geometric and the geometric buildings, indicated with the red line drawings in the uh, picture. And most of them have these horse-shaped structures, one of them being longer than the others. Yeah. This one. Um, and it's located right in front of the geometric altar, which would be here, where only well animal sacrifice, sacrifices uh, have been attested. And then we've got these smaller semicircular buildings, um, the, the one in the north having traces of metal working activities and the northern sacrificial area where most Egyptian and Near Eastern material were found. The function of these structures has not been clearly attested and so we will go through the finds to see how the site could have been used in the early Iron Age. The ceramics found inside the horseshoe structures of the temple have provided a number of imports from Attica, Argos, Corinth, East Greece, Cyprus and the Near East. Uh, the Cypriot shirts are bio from Lekithia, white painted ware, and some black on red bowls. Some shirts of amphorae are from East Greece, Cyclades, North Aegean, Cyprus, and Phoenicia. Uh, some belly shirts decorated with concentric circles belong to Cypriot amphorae of phases two and three. Uh, we also have a, a Phoenician shoulder, number 254, and a piece of a jar with a horizontal handle, which is number 251. Uh, which also belong to phases two and three. And these are the finds from the horseshoe structures, but then in the north sacrificial area, uh, located at the, at the northeast end of the temple, uh, there was also pottery, as we heard before. Uh, from all the ceramics found at the area, most of them were being used for rituals, such as uh, Idria, with the geometric and orientalizing styles. And 10% of the ceramics were pots with different shapes, some of them open shapes, as we heard, skiffoy craters or vases, and others with closed shapes, such as Lekithia and Amphrae. Amphrae seem to occur only in the archaic period of the uh, northern sacrificial area, so no shirts have been found for the geometric period. Therefore, based on the presence of Amphrae shirts, we could say that the horseshoe buildings were connected to some kind of trade or storage, whereas the northern area would not be linked to any of these activities, but mainly to eating and drinking activities, or the deposition of votive pots. Some bronze objects found in the longest horseshoe structure of the temple appear to have a Syrian provenance, and they present similar characteristics to those objects found at the Arayon of Samos. Two horse blinders appear to have been made in a North Syrian workshop around the 9th century BC, although the way they arrived at Eubea is still under debate. And they reproduce an identical scene, a naked central character wearing a loincloth who holds two lions, and on the right, an eagle is depicted on the top blinder, and two rosettes are depicted on the bottom one, uh, which also presents an Aramic inscription regarding a donation by Hadad to King Hazel in order to cross the river. And this is precisely the same inscription found at one figurine from the Arayon of Samos. A bronze statuette of a female figure with Egyptian traits was also found in the long building. She's wearing a long cloth, holding a lotus flower in each hand, and she has a disc around her head. Some similar representations are found in Syria and Palestine, 
And this piece was probably made with a mold using the technique of the lost wax. The metal sheet is too thick for repuse and it does not have any hammering hints. And the details are incised afterwards. The hairstyle and the disc are very Egyptian and iconographically uh, it might represent uh, a nap, a sauté, a shera or pedeshet. A similar figure of raised arms, same dress and lotus flower is uh, found in Nimrud. A masculine bareheaded figure wearing a tunic with short sleeves and, a sitting, and sitting on a stool was also linked to Syrian or Phoenician manufacture and dated to the 8th century BC. He wears a necklace and earrings, and he's holding a conic bowl with both hands. This figurine might come from Biblos or alternative, alter, uh, alternatively from Encomi in Cyprus, or even it might come from some Western site. And it presents similarities to a statue found again at the Arayon of Samos. A badly preserved bronze bowl is also attested from the Eastern Mediterranean between the 9th and 7th centuries uh, BC, probably from the area of Assyria. And according to Skiaka, these plates are exported and imitated also in Etruria. So here we can see some connections with the West as well. The temple area uh, yielded just a few examples of Egyptian objects, uh, a scarab made of Egyptian blue faience and two scarabs made of stone. The stone ones seem to belong to the group of the smith from Lyre in North Syria. And then the northern sacrificial area, however, um, gave a great amount of Near Eastern and Egyptian material. Different types of scaraboid seals were found in this northern sacrificial area, and they appear to belong to the group of the, the jewelry of Lyre as well, representing scenes of musicians, two men, a sitting man and a palmeret, which find parallels in the scarabs from Rhodes. Scarabs from Mialisos, from Lindos, and from Camiros. Um, they are made of different materials, including amber, stone, and glass, and belong to different dynasties of Egypt, some of them being sus uh, suspected of being Phoenician due to its iconography, such as Scarab 168, which has an Assyrian looking tree. And the scarabs from Camiros in Rhodes. And an example from Kipion also resembles scarab number 163, so that connects it even more to Phoenician manufacture. Other scarabs, such as the ones made of glass, resemble the ones found at the Rayon of Peracora. Some other scarabs found in Phoenicia, in Syria, in Rhodes, in Sparta, the Rayon of Argos, Chios, Crete, and Cyprus. Other metallic objects were discovered at the northern area as well a few rings of silver, bronze, and electro. These present similarities to rings found in Rhodes, Creek, Amanthus on Cyprus, uh, Artemis Orthia at Sparta, and Egypt, as well as East Greece and Almina. Amulets in the shape of Egyptian divinities include Bes, Isis Hathor, Nefertum, Ta, Thot, Sekhmet or Bastet, and the presence of figurines of foreign divinities at a temple presumably dedicated to Apollo suggests a few things. One option, A, it could be that these statuettes were only seen as exotic products due to luxurious commerce happening in the area that had no repercussions in the beliefs of local populations. B, that those people visiting the temple, presumably Eastern seafarers, would at first only worship Egyptian divinities and later on it would become a temple dedicated to the Greek god Apollo. Or C, that Greek gods were confused or associated with foreign divinities, which is a similar phenomenon to what could have happened at the Temple of Komos in southern Crete, which is a sanctuary also associated to Apollo, where we have found sculptures of Sekhmet and Nefertum, and Sekhmet and Nefertum, together with Ta, uh, form the uh, Egyptian triad. So this could have been associated to the Greek triad of Apollo, Leto, and Artemis. And the same phenomenon could have happened uh, in Eretria. In conclusion, the Temple of Apollo at Eretria has several successive buildings, both geometric and geometric structures, with a horseshoe shape below the archaic and classical structures. And the northernmost of these geometric buildings is where we would have had metalworking. The longer building of the same period is where the horse blinders and the um, other figurines were found. 
the altar where there where would have been the animal sacrifices and the northern sacrificial area with Egyptian material. So we can maybe say that one building had one function, so each building would have its own function, or we can say that a group of buildings would have had one function, or maybe a group of buildings would have had several functions, which is probably this case. So what we have in Ateretria would have been a religious area, not just a religious building, would have been a religious group of buildings, um, there would have been a space of dedication to the divinity at the northern area, where votives would have also been placed, a space for animal sacrifices at the altar, followed by the construction of a building that uh, could have been related to a temple, even though up to the moment of construction there would have been no formal temple and probably re religious activities would have presumably been outdoors. And this space would have not just been a religious space, it would have not just been a religious group of buildings, but also a commercial group of buildings. The pottery finds in the other buildings indicate that the southernmost building would have been probably used for eating and drinking, and the elongated building provided us with shirts of amphorae, some of them from Near Eastern origin, and this could mean that the area was used for both purposes, commerce and eating, uh, since proto-geometric times. Um, the presence of transport and storage jars, as well as other kinds of open shapes, could indicate the use of the building as a stopping point for merchants, not just for resting and eating, but also for trading. And with the time, or maybe around the same time as it started being used as a port of coal around the 8th century, merchants and locals frequenting the site would have also uh, reclaimed the need of a worshipping area, so the establishment of an altar and later on of a religious building would have been organized. Accepting this assumption, the second theory about the beliefs in Egyptian divinities from the moment of creation of the temple could be accepted, even though an association between Egyptian and Greek divinities could have also occurred. Uh, one more aspect to take into account is the international character of a temple with such a proximity to the seashore, which attests connections with other Aegean sites, such as Samos and specifically its temple dedicated to Era, which is a sanctuary that would have had similar characteristics and functions to the one from Eretria, as well as the temple of Kition Bambula in Cyprus, where metalworking practices also took place, and the temple B of Comos on Crete, and possibly the port temple of Brulia in Southern Rhodes. Moreover, Eretria could have been a port of entry of Egyptian and Near Eastern objects to Euboea. Even though sites like Lefkandi seem to have yielded a lot more of Oriental materials, it seems that Lefkandi maybe would have been an end to these exchanges, where, whereas Eretria would have been the, the port of entry. The temple of Apollo Daphnephorus would therefore form part of the network of Aegean temples uh, integrated in commercial districts, often controlled by Oriental uh, merchants. And these districts would have been a stopping point where seafarers would have rested, worshipped their gods, eaten and sold products. Therefore, the structures forming the early Iron Age temple of the temple of Apollo at Eretria was where commercial exchanges between foreigners and locals took place, as well as a hybridization of religious practices that denote that cultures cannot be considered in isolation. Thank you very much. Now we will uh, have Olivia Dank with a um, uh, lecture who begin with a um, question. Is it a match? Religious relations between the island of Libya and the Calcidus, northern Aegean focus in Europe. <coughs> Yeah, thank you, and I also thank the organizers for inviting me. And yeah, I think now it is time to travel from Euboea to the north. More precisely to my research area, the Shakidiki, or Shakidike. And I will start with an introduction about this region, followed by a study of the relations between Euboea and the Shakidian Peninsula. The first example of the ties between those two regions is represented actually in the famous philosopher Aristotle, who was born in Stagira on Chalkidiki, 
and died in Chalkis on Euboea. And speaking of Chalkis on Euboea, um, I want to uh, say it's also yeah controversial for Chalkidiki uh, where the name for this peninsula derives, and Chalkis is one of the answers. So. And what I want to note in advance, uh, since I discuss uh, both the Shakidiki and the Yubian city Shakis, uh, I will use the adjectival form Shakidikian uh, for Shakidiki and Shakidian for Shakis in hope of avoiding um, confusion. Just to let you know. The Shakidiki is a peninsula in northern Greece, itself trident-like shaped with three promontories named uh, Palena in ancient times uh, Flecra, modern Cassandra, also the first finger or the first leg, as you say it in Greek, uh, then Sithonia, and you have Athos and Arcte, and those three promontories extending into the Aegean Sea. And today, the territorial border of Shakidiki is shown by the following red line uh, missing, of course, the independent region of Mount Athos. And I have expanded my research area, what I call Shakiki, a little bit and defined it by ge geographical aspects rather than political. Um, the west-east border is formed by the Tamai Gulf and the Stramonic Gulf, while the inland extends to the edges of the Coronea and the Boulder Lake, and thus describing uh, like a boundary curve, as you yeah, see here. But of course, I'm leaving out Thessaloniki and also Argilos. <clears throat> yeah, just a short introduction. My doctoral thesis, Cults and Sanctuary on Shakiniki, is an official project of the Swiss National Science Foundation based at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And together with my two supervisors, Professor Martin Kugelsberg from Basel and Professor Wutiras from Thessaloniki, I'm seeking to present the first overview of the sacred landscape of the Shakidian Peninsula, beginning in the late Bronze Age down to the Roman Empire. And in this regional study, um, the sites are evaluated with the help of uh, literary, epigraphic, numismatic, and archaeological resources. And in total, I deal with 25 places and about 12 sanctuary sites, if I want to use this term here. And the number, it depends on how you want to count them. You see, I put there some question marks still. And the, result, uh, seek, um, the results seek to complete the religious studies in Northern Greece, where the regions of Upper and Lower Macedonia have been already analyzed. Uh, already, Adolf Struck uh, tested the Shakidiki a special existence, and the latest version for the definition of Shakidiki uh, comes from Stephanos Gimatsidis, who divides the area of northern Greece into different microregions. And for the Shakidiki, uh, he says that this is the zone with the strongest southern Greek influence. And this southern Greek influence is especially connected with the impact of the Eubians. So here's the connection um, and their role in the early colonization of the northern Aegean produced a discourse about the formation of settlements on Shakidiki. And the rich resources made Shakidiki really an attractive area for settlers because the peninsula provided so much like mineral deposits, timber, and also natural base and fertile land. So the Shakidiki became like something we can call a colonization hotspot, especially in, yeah, in terms of scholars who want to see it like this. This is a old perception. And modern scholars have only very recently cut free from this colonial ideology that dominated the discipline from its beginning. And with my first example, I will show you why this traditional view of Eubians as colonizers of the north needs an update. I start with Dikaya. Dikaya, for a long time, the location was uncertain. And the most recent evidence placed it in the region of Nea Calicatea, as you can see here. And from literary sources, 
uh, Vicaya is known as a colony of Eretria. Also, uh, onomastic studies um, done by Denis Knöpfler and uh, Emmanuel Botiras uh, proved the attribution as a Eretian colony. <clears throat> but now, let's see what the numismatic evidence can tell us. Uh, I show you here three coins without any um, name where you might yeah, get an idea where it comes from. And this is like, it's not just a test for you, it was like, uh, you see, they share the same types. On the uppers, you can see a cow standing facing its hind leg, raised to scratch its uh, muscle. And on its back, we have two types here. This is also a bird, while the reverse um, is with a mill sail in queues for German Windmühlensegel. And yeah, now you can argue, is this coinage from the same place? If I give you the solution, you see, both of them, uh, two of them, are from Dikaya, and one is from Karistos, which is on Eubea. <clears throat> so I just informed you <laughs> before that Dikaya was supposed to be a colony of Eretria. So why we find in Dikaya coins that have relations with Karistos? <clears throat> Another example from the coinage. Here you can see the well-known coin type for Eretria with the cow on the uppers and the octopus on the rivers. Uh, so, the left one shows you the one from Eretria, you can guess it from the Epsilon, and on the right, there's an example from Dikaya. So, coins from Dikaya shows also the same types here. Another interesting comparison um, on the coins from Dikaya is also the cock represented, which is just known from the coinage of uh, Karistos. You see here an example of the rivers on the right side. So what we can record so far, uh, that the coinage of Tikaya is combining the types like the cow, the cock, the octopus, used also by Eretria and Karistos. And the traditional view presumed that Eubean coinage influenced coin production in Tikaya rather than vice versa, because the scholars are thinking like, in this way, of course, if Eritrea, or let's say the Eubeans, are colonizing the north, then Dikaya should follow um, yeah, the Eubean coinage. But <laughs> I didn't put here a date for a purpose. Actually, uh, the well-known or prominent numismatist uh, Peter von Arden delivered in his paper about the beginnings of the Eubean coinage the following explanation. The picture that emerges of the beginnings of Eubean and Yakidikan minting suggests that the coin production began earlier in the so-called northern colonies than it did in the mother cities to the south. To explain everything in detail, we don't have time here, but uh, one of his main statements is <coughs> Uh, this picture effectively reverses previous thinking which placed priority of minting with the Eubean mother cities, informed to some extent, no doubt, by suppositions that colonies would be dependent followers rather than independent innovators. And this suggestion, suggestion aligns as well with the argument made elsewhere of northern colonies initiating coinage before the South metropolis. So here, uh, we have to really change our point of view and think a little bit vice versa because the normal idea is about that everything is coming from the south that are colonizing the north but actually here we have a really good example because for especially Dikaya we have those coins way earlier or the same at the same time like we have the coinage from uh, Eretia or Karistos and Actually, it was the opposite. So the Eubeans came into the north and saw this well-established coinage system, and they adopted it. <clears throat> also, recent studies demonstrated that the northern Aegean colonies were some of the first outside of Asia Minor to adopt coinage after its invention in the Lydian and Ionian heartland. And therefore, it's important to know 
that the rich gold and silver mines provided perfect conditions to feed developing mines. Because especially on Hakidiki, we have a lot of uh, mineral de deposits and also uh, Mount Pangaeon is uh, close by. And I, would, I wanted to show quick, um, you can also divide the Hakidiki in two zones, east and west, which the so-called here Ubik Ionic standard and a reduced Malaysian one in the east. And it's interesting that this Ubiq Ionic standard moved actually, also this is a modern term, moved from the north to the south. It extended into Ubiya, and this is why we found all those types in Karistas and Eretria, for example. <clears throat> What we can learn from this is that the shed types of the cities of Dikaya, Eretria and Karistos showed that they would have been acceptable for payments in all locations. So this was in terms of trade a really good um, thing to do. <clears throat> for the coinage of Dikaya exists until now no study, but from the few dozen examples that survive of this coinage, they can come in a surprising range of varieties. So. And all those arguments we have until now, they stress that the North was way earlier than we have it on Ubia. I am sorry, just um, here a card or a map, we can see the deposits. So they had a lot of material to use on Hakiliki. Now we move on to Aphetus, uh, modern Califea. Um, to a cave, and this cave is situated um, in a seaside sanctuary which belonged to the nearby ancient city of Aphetus, as you can see here. And this is a modern view. So we just focus on the cave. And the attribution of a cave to a, a particular deity is not always clear, especially cults of Dionysus are rarely detectable. The the exception is the cave of Califea, which is one of the few securely identified caves for the Dionysos in Greece. And the cave fits into the Dionysian landscape, where the god was associated with several features like mountains, woods, caves and springs. And also, we know already from Homer in the hymn to Dionysos that he has a strong connection with caves, and he was also raised um, by the nymphs of Nasa. So for this cave, we have literary evidence uh, that also reveals the therapeutic function of the place. So we know this from Xenophon. So I'll just give you a short overview. So this is actually the entrance to the cave. What you see before, just ignore it for the moment. And behind, you see a staircase. Um, and inside the cave, there is nothing found, unfortunately, <laughs> but we have some other evidence. And here I make a comparison of Apetus and the school of Aristotle, because uh, both share the same reconstruction in the fourth century, where the staircase was added to reach a, a niche, the upper one, as you can see here. I know it's a little bit difficult to, to look at it and just to give you the proof that it's actually for the Dionysos, we have an inscribed uh, shirts uh, for the Dionysos. Then we have a marble head, an inscription uh, with a priest of the Dionysos. And also we have the numismatic evidence where you can find images from, yeah, which are related to the Dionysian uh, canon, like a cantharos or also crepes. So, and what I want to show you now is Katja Sporn was mapping the sacred caves of Greece and has shown that other caves of Dionysos are only known through literary sources. The list is quite short. Um, there's just Euboea, Naxos, and Mount Pangaeon, where you can find a cave connected to Dionysos. So this makes the importance of the cave of Aphetus even yeah, more important. Um, yeah, the cave of, of Aphetus becoming more important. And yeah, this cave on Eubea, we just know it from Pausanias, and it's still, yeah, we have to find it. This would be interesting comparison then. 
And now some other small ties between Shakidiki and Yubia. I just want to show you Arefusan. This is a place on Shakidiki located here in the north. And here it's interesting. On Shakidiki, Arefusa appears at Poseidon's wife, and together they had a son named Abbas or Abantus. And this uh, son of, the, of Poseidon and Arefusa is declared as the Ginarch of the Eubians, which is quite interesting. So for Shalkis, uh, Manuel uh, Arona Perez has shown a different move in connection with Poseidon and Arefusa. And according to this move, Poseidon had intercourse with the young mortal, Arefusa, and then abandoned her. And then we have Hera, and she uh, took mercy of Arefusa and transformed her into a spring. So on Shalkis, we find a spring of Arefusa. Then, because we are talking about a lot of Artemis, I just put this in. On Shakidiki, there's also a lagoon sanctuary for Artemis, uh, which is, might be for Limnea or uh, for Pythia. And Artemis was here to worship between the 7th and 5th century. And it was really, you can call it a lagoon sanctuary, which we already talked about. So there are certain similarities, of course, uh, to locate a sanctuary for Artemis near shore or in this uh, area where you find those natural features. And then, because we were talking about uh, Placari, um, here is just my example for the one hilltop sanctuary uh, I have on Shakidiki, which is on Parthenoras. You can see the hill here. Uh, so this one. And the site needs more uh, research, of course, but there's something like you see on top of this hill, there is something like this, uh, yeah, rocky features and you find some niches there. But what is also interesting is um, the site is in the middle of an optical line which can be drawn between Mount Olympus and Mount Athos and seen therefore um, a special point in the landscape, which is quite interesting. For this hilltop sanctuary, uh, it's not clear which deity was worshipped there. It can be related with um, uh, Zeus, but this has to yeah, prove who still. We don't know. And the last example I want to give you is uh, Posidi. The sanctuary is of great importance because it represents the one safely identified sanctuary of Poseidon in the area of ancient Macedonia. Its position is here, and it's on a, um, as you can see in this picture, it's located on a flat sandy cape on the Panele, Palene Peninsula in Tekiki, and lies about four kilometer uh, west of the ancient city of Mende. And yeah, what I want to stress out here is that Mende is, always, is also from literary evidence, always called the colony of Eretria. And Irene Lemos stated that Posidi appears to fit well the model of an extra urban sanctuary founded near a colony to strengthen the territorial claims of the nearby settlement of Mende. But whether is this the actual reason for its foundation or whether in fact it may have been founded before the settlement will remain uncertain until the publication of the site is complete and she, said, she stated this actually some years ago and we're still waiting for the publication. So this is actually still not clear, but it's a really um, important um, sanctuary. Just to give you a quick overview, this absolute okay. absidal building ST, as you can see here, is dated into this 10th century. And inside there was also an uh, ash altar, which is dated earlier, which about um, started, or we have the earliest evidence there from the late Machineer period. And just on the opposite, you see building Rama, building Rama, um, which has two different phases and it's just like um, like the structures are kissing each other into it and 
it's super interesting because in the in this labeling of to call this the extra urban sanctuary of Mende, we have to be a little bit more aware that although we have evidence for Mende that there is something in the 12th century because there we have found refuse pits and also we have evidence that the Ubians were there of course they have a presence but to call everything a colony of Eretria um, I just want to uh, yeah, give you here more awareness that you really have to show on the details and to make a really more uh, differentiated view on this. And for example, what I want to see here, you see on the map also Mende and the Sanctuary of Posidi together. It's, it's a nice explanation to label the Pusidi as the extra urban sanctuary. I mean, it's just about four kilometers, which you can declare the distance would make sense for an extra urban sanctuary. But still, I, I don't like this term for, for this. And also, Denis Klöpfer, Denis Klöpfer was asking, um, the question if actually this code for Posidi comes from Uvia, actually, I would say he was asking the wrong question here. Because as we've seen so far the whole day, we don't have a main sanctuary for Poseidon on Uvia. We know just from literary sources, we have Garestos and Aigai, which is uncertain to lay, which is not with certainty uh, located. And I would presume that the influence also goes here more from the north than to the, um, yeah, from the north to the south. So this old perception, we, yeah, we have still in our minds. Um, I want to have an update here or just to make you more aware of this. Yeah, and with this, I hope I could give you a quick overview about the, yeah, there are a lot of relations as you, as you saw between Shakiriki and Yuvia. And I thank you for your attention.